two vectors a and b. Okay. And this is this is starting from some sort of origin and some coordinate system. So we've got two vectors a and b with an angle either between them. The definition of the dot product between a and b, so a transpose b then, okay, that's a scalar number called. A transpose b is going to be a scalar value divided through by the length of vector a and the length of vector b is equal to the cosine. So that's something you should recall from, from say, the first year of math class. And we're going to use that now to take a look at a bit of math that introduces the key equation from PCA. And we're going to go back to this picture and we're going to try and redraw this now for a coordinate system. Let's say there's my direction vector P1. And let's draw my coordinate system here, X1. <coughs> And let's take a data point up here. This is some, some row from x. So any row from x, let's call it x subscript i. That's a vector. And being a vector, it starts here at the origin. And it lands up at that point. So that's my vector x. This is another vector p here that defines that loading direction of radius various. I've removed the other points for now, but let's assume this direction P goes in that, that direction of radius various. And we're going to derive the score value T from this. So there's an angle theta over here. And we know that this perpendicular drop down onto that loading vector P. The distance then from the origin That distance, let me just write it here, just to emphasize that that's not a vector, that's a distance, is equal to t i, so it's the i observation, comma 1, because we're getting those components. So that distance there is t i 1. So the other thing we know about angles is that the cosine of theta is defined as the adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosine of theta is equal to the adjacent distance divided by the hypotenuse distance. And in this case, what is the adjacent distance? Ti and the hypotenuse distance, the norm, the norm of x i. So this is using a simple, uh, simple definition from high school to calculate the cosine of theta is the ratio of two scalar numbers. Okay. This first scalar number is the adjacent distance, ti one. And the denominator is the norm, or the, the length of vector x, i. So we can equate that cosine of theta because uh, I've erased it all here, so let's just put it back up here. Cosine of theta for arbitrary vector a and b is defined as a transpose b divided by the length of a times the length of b. Okay. So using that same relationship over here, yeah. someone from the back, Matt, what would be the numerator over here in this particular case? Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to write cosine of theta in this form over here. Okay, so it's the dot product between two vectors. Which two vectors would be here in the numerator? P1. Sorry? P1, yeah. yeah. Xi. 
prefer to write it in a slightly different order. Okay. There's no reason why you can, uh, can't interchange them. I could have written P1 transpose Xi, but from convention we'll write Xi transpose P1. We get the same number, right? So our products are, we can mix them around, we'll get the same, same result. Okay. So this, I could have also written this as B transpose A divided by It's identical. We get the same result. What goes on the denominator? Someone from the back over there. Here. Okay. <laughs> You're not paying attention for that. <laughs> what goes on the denominator? Uh, the absolute value of xi or and uh, pi. Pi. Okay. So absolute value of these two vectors, xi. Now, I haven't stated this yet, um, so let's do so now. By definition, with PCA, we will always set our loading directions, P1, to have unit length. That is not, it's not a hard concept to understand. All it says is we're going to define this vector so that if I calculate the norm of it or the length of it, it will have length equal to 1. Okay? And it doesn't matter if if I make this vector equal, have length equal to 1, it will be that long. The fact that I've drawn it that long still not change its direction. Okay? The direction stays the same, the magnitude is all that changes. So by definition, we create the magnitude of this vector, P1, P2, P3, to have unit length, unit magnitude. So if I simplify this equation, um, let me just correct this over here, this should be xi. If I simplify that equation, I can write this as Ti1, so the score value, the scalar value Ti for the first component is equal to Xi, the data in my X matrix for the i row after pre-processing, after centering and scaling. So Xi1 is just my data that I'm applying the PC model to transpose P1. Okay. And that is the key equation of PCA to remember. It says the score value is nothing more than Xi vectors entries multiplied in the dot product of that loading direction P1. Is that the uh, uh, I Uh, Xi, yeah, why am I writing Xi for the one? Uh, Xi. Yeah, because we're just taking vector Xi. Yeah, I don't know why I have that. Sorry. Thanks for picking that up, yeah. Okay, so sorry about that. It's uh, just Xi, no, no comma one, because this refers to a vector Xi. It's just the i row from the x matrix. So this should bring some new light to you for whenever you see in any journal article, not just in this part, but in any of your work, whenever you see a dot product, this is immediately what you should be thinking about. That it's nothing more than a projection. That's all that a dot product is telling you. Saying that this distance, Ti1, from the origin to where that green point lands, is the dot product between the vector that defines this blue point and the vector along which I'm projecting. So there's a geometric interpretation, it's easy to understand from the picture, but you should also be able to translate that mathematically and be able to go the other way around. Usually you'll see this in a journal article, but the authors won't describe it in nice English words or in pictorial form like this. So whenever you see this in a journal article, this is what you need to be thinking about. That it's nothing more than a projection on of this data point onto the line. And that's why PCA and any of the latent variable method tools we use are called projection methods because at their heart, all they're doing is projecting data that you measure onto a new space. All these tools are just called projection methods. PCA is one form of projection, PLS is another. There's several other types. At the heart of all those, if you look at the equations, this, there's a dot product in there somewhere, which is why it's a projection. 
So this is for a single row. Let's just complete this up and take this for the entire data matrix. So I've taken my x value, so I've taken a particular row here called xi, and uh, let me just write down this side. And here's my t1 vector, and I've calculated ti comma 1 from this xi row by multiplying this row in x by this loading p1 transpose. Okay, so I take this value in xi times that value in p1 plus this value in xi times that value in p1 plus this one times that one, this one times that one. So I calculate this linear combination xi times p1, xi the second column times p1 in the second column, xi the third column times its corresponding third loading until I go to the end of the columns the sum of those combinations get me single number scalar value ti for that i row. I can go do that for every single row, so xi plus 1, xi plus 2, up until the last row, calculate the corresponding t's, okay? And you can show to yourself mathematically that will get you t1 as the vector. I can calculate this entire vector in one operation by saying, x times p. So simply do this multiple times. I get multiple scalars here. Rather than doing that iteratively, I can just do it in one bang. t1 as a vector is equal to my x times p1. So going from, from vectors to vectors. Let's just write it out mathematically. Xi1 times P11. So that term plus the term from the second column plus the term from the third column and so on. <coughs> Combine it with the term from the last column gets me a scalar value Ti1. That's what the linear combination is. So T, we'll say this. So this is a bit of a mouthful, so let's just, let's just do it probably two twice. So Ti is a linear combination of x's given by the coefficients in P. So mathematically what we've done here, we've said we've calculated our score is a linear combination of the x's given by the weights in P. Um, for those of you that look at uh, things as a weighted sum, these coefficients P are fixed, okay? Once I've calculated my first component, these P values are fixed. So those are constants. My x is changing. Every time I go to a new row, my x values change, but my p values stay the same. Okay? So all I'm doing is I'm calculating a weighted sum of my x's with the weights given by p. So every new row, I calculate a new weighted sum. So my score here, t, is nothing more than a weighted sum of the values within a row of x. Is that clear, that, that terminology of linear combinations and weighted sums? I will use that all the time for, from now on. So uh, if it's not clear now, replay the video later on and uh, make sure you understand that. Okay, so let's now see if, you, if, if we can make some sense of this. So given that, we're going to try and interpret this equation up here. So our ti value is xi transpose p. Given that we know after centering and scaling our xi's are centered and scaled, so those numbers are between minus 4 and plus 4 okay, for well-behaved data. And also the entries in p lie between minus 1 and plus 1. That's because by definition the length of p is of unit length, so you can show then that this, the entries must be between minus 1 and plus 1. And no, minus 1 and plus 1, because the, the length of the vector is the sum of squares square root. So you can have a negative chance of that. So using the fact that ti is equal to that expression over there, uh, and I, I don't know why this is dropped off, so just add in over there on the left hand side ti comma one. That's what the 
that are missing over there on the left side. How would you get a large positive T1 value or a large positive square? Large x's, large positive x's. Okay. Any other way? Negative x times a negative p will give you a large positive t. That's, that's also correct. So we can have every one of these terms adds up to give us our, our t1 value for the i that you owe. So I can have a negative times a negative here. So a negative loading times a negative score, a negative x times a negative loading. And I can have a positive x that's above the center times a positive loading. And I can keep adding them up and I'll get a large positive overall T1 value. Okay. How can I get a large negative T1? Abdul? Combination of negative and positive. Yeah, any, either a positive X and a negative P or a positive P and a negative X. Okay. So you can, that's what, what a linear combination does. It's, there's, a, it's, there's multiple ways in which we can get that uh, value at the end to either be a large positive or a large negative. Well, how would you get a value that's approximately zero? One of them is zero? Or P is zero or X. Yeah, but then you're summing up multiple values. So some are positive, some are negative, and they all cancel each other out. So by the end, you get a number that's approximately zero. Or all of your X's are, are zero would be one other way of doing it. Okay. What, would, what does an observation mean where all the x's are zeros? When the observation is right at the, at the midpoint of our coordinate system. So after mean centering, if, if you're, all your entries in x are zero, it means your point is right there. So it means that if you happen to have measured a data point where all your x values after centering and scaling are zero, it means that in your original data system, that point was right in the middle of everything. Okay. And that's unusual, but it could happen where you could get numbers close to zero. So those are different ways in which you can move this t value around by having different x's. So the p's are fixed, the p's are that direction vector, after you've found that direction, it's, it stays. But then your x has changed as you go from one row to the next. Every row, you can get a different value of t. Some will be positive, large positive, some will be large negative, some will be positive, zero. Let's say, can, uh, we answered this question early on. <laughs> you will preempted me. Can you get two observations, let's say row 13 and 22, where their corresponding scores for the first components are roughly the same. Yes, we saw that pictorially over here. Um, if I take any two data points and they happen to coincide in the same position uh, along that, that distance, then they get the same score value. But notice that I can get the same T1 value from two x's that are very different from each other. One, one point is up here and one point is down here. But once I project them on to the line, they look the same, they've got the same T1 value. But that's very unsatisfying because remember we said at the beginning of the class, we want to calculate this PCA model so it best explains the data. Now you're telling me that it's possible to have two different rows in my X matrix which have the same T1 value, but yet I know those two rows are so different. One is up here, one's down here. How can, how can that be? Right. They're being, they both get the same T1 value of the first component. So what's going on here? Not quite, no. So this point over here has the same positive T1 value as this point down here. Yes, that's true from T1 perspective, but if you add the second component on, they'll have what has the T2 value. So this one will have a large positive T2, and this one will have a, a negative T2. So from the first component's point of view, they look the same, but they'll be differentiated and separated out of the second component. Okay. 
And that leads us to the next step is looking at the residuals and the errors. Yeah. So is that how you choose the number of uh, components you use then? It's, it's very much related to that, yeah. From an intuitive perspective, you can say that, yeah. Um, so I'll skip over this for now. I don't, don't want to go into this detail, but I will look at this. So we're going to now add an extra layer of complexity. So PCA we said explains data. When we say it explains data in the best possible way, it means that there's probably something that we haven't explained. Okay, we've explained it to the, we've added one component to have the lowest uh, or the best explanation with the lowest error. Then we add a second component, we add a third component. Why do we keep adding those components and how do we know when to stop? Okay, and those answers are tied up in looking at this residual distance, the errors. So we're going to really study now in this uh, next bit here the residual. And it's, it's very straightforward to understand, actually. Uh, this diagram just makes it look a bit complicated. But let's take a look at what we've got here. Everything on this illustration is what we've seen today. Here's my coordinate system starting at 0 over here. And my data point up there, xi. So that's a vector. There's this angle theta between this first component loading, P1, which is a unit vector. Okay, so P1 has length equal to 1. And this projection of x onto this vector, P, that distance is Ti1. Okay, so that's, that's what we know already. This projection, though, that point at which that projection falls can be um, summarized by a vector value as well. If I draw a vector from the origin to that point with the blue open circle, that is a, is a point, it's not a, a point in my data set, it's a point that I'm creating now, and I'll give it a new name, x hat. Same subscript, i, comma, 1, because I'm creating this projection onto p1 with using the first component for the i row in my data set. That's what that notation means. So this is my pre my prediction, actually, of x onto the model space, this p1 vector, using one component. That distance is t1, but that also can be summarized by a vector, which we'll call this xi, uh, x subscript i1, comma 1. Okay. So, if we want to write this vector down, we do, we don't we need we need three numbers for it. If we're back here in three-dimensional space, we need to find three values for this prediction x hat. Or if we're in more more generally, if we're in k-dimensional column space, we need k values to define this vector x hat. Okay. What values do I write for that? direction times the distance. So we know what the direction is. This direction here is P1, but P1 is a unit vector. So it may, it's a short vector over here, length equal to 1. I need to scale that vector, make it bigger or smaller as the case might be, by how much? By, the, by that value, T1. So x hat I'm using transposes now to indicate that I'm writing this in row form, is nothing more than the P1 vector, which is a unit vector, and I scale it up or down by that distance. Okay. So that's all that xi, xi hat is. And you can show then, just, I've just written out the notation here, that's so each of these, the so 1 by k vector, multiplied is equal to a scalar times this vector. And you can interpret x i hat as my best prediction of x using one component. Okay. In this case, best means smallest error. Now, I, I'm leaving that there because the next class we'll look at PCA from an optimization point of view where we actually write an objective function where we want to minimize error, and we'll look at it from that perspective. But for now, uh, that's how x hat is calculated. We find the best prediction of x where this error is smallest. And what is the error? 
it's that residual vector over there. Okay? So you know from geometry then that this vector over here, xi, is, can be written as the sum of two other vectors. Okay? I can write this as, so this is xi hat, xi, this vector is equal to the sum of x hat plus this vector over here, which is called the error. Just using the straightforward vector sum, the definition of, of vectors and, and the summation of them, this vector x can be broken down into two pieces. This horizontal vector here along the loading direction P1, which is given by x i hat, plus this residual vector E. So I'm breaking this vector down into two pieces. Or conversely, um, you, can, you can rearrange this equation and most, it's more intuitive sometimes to interpret that residual as EI is equal to X minus X hat. So this is more familiar to those of you that have seen P squared. So you say the error is equal to observed minus predicted. Okay. I've just rearranged that equation. But the other way you can see it is I'm saying X is equal to my prediction of it plus some residual. <coughs> Uh, we'll, we'll discuss that in the next class. So the question was, how, what is the lowest value that error can have? And, well, actually, let's not discuss the next class. Let's look at it now. If I look back at this plane over here, okay, and I've used two components in my model, what is the smallest residual distance I can have? Zero. And what does a point look like that has a residual error of zero? It's right on the plane. So, so there you go. Yeah. Uh, well, I think more where you were heading is, can we get all our points to have error of zero? Well, maybe you weren't heading there, but uh, if you were heading there, if you were asking the question, can I get all my points to have error equal to zero? The question, the answer is yes. By adding many, many components, as many, the maximum possible, and eventually you'll drive your error right down to zero. But we'll talk a bit about that in the next class. Okay, but the point right now that has error equal to zero is a point that's on your plane. Okay. <clears throat> so that, I, I apologize, my slides are maybe slightly out of order how I presented them here. Um, when I was planning this class, I was going to talk to them in this order, but we've gone a little bit ahead and come back to this. So we've broken X down into two parts. The point on the plane and the residual distance off the plane. Okay. So, here I've illustrated for you, or not here rather, but on this, this slide over here, I had what it looks like for a single component. Let me just quickly describe for two components, xi hat represents the location on this plane. Let's take that blue point. And let's say that point is a certain amount off the plane. So this, this, this blue point isn't quite on this orange plane you find it. It's a little bit above it. At the perpendicular distance down onto that plane represents, is represented by xi hat in the first direction and xi hat in the second direction. Okay. Because I just used this equation that I had up here. So xi hat for the first component is t for that for that row t1 value times p1, but then there's also xi hat with the second component, which is equal to t2 uh, ti2. So if I go add a second component now, I get a t2 value for that i row times the corresponding p2 value. So for every component I add, I get a new xi hat value. So that's, that's for component two, component one, 
it's the same that I'm running my children. So TI 1 plus 1 So I've written, I've written these two equations in, uh, the other way. I would have normally written the other one first. But the key point here is I get an xi hat for my first uh, component, and I get an xi hat for my second component. Jointly, those two vectors define this, the point on my plane. Let me come back to this blue point. x1 hat is a vector that goes from the origin along this first component and lands up over here. Okay, so x1 hat is some vector that's over here. x2 hat is a vector that's over there. The point on the plane is the summation of those two vectors. Okay, so this is coming back to this uh, idea of, of summing two vectors. So here's my first vector, here's my second vector. The point on the plane below this blue point, I project this blue point down onto the plane. That point over there somewhere is given by the sum of x1 hat plus x2 hat. Each of these are vectors. Okay. It's a little bit confusing. I should have had an illustration for this one, but um, and I, I will bring, bring one to class next time. Let's just substitute in, if I, if I say, say that, I can say this is equal to T1, Ti1, P1, transpose, plus Ti2, P2, transpose, okay? And this is now my prediction of that row using two components. Okay. So I'm saying T1, P1, plus T2, P2. I improve my prediction of X by adding new component and new component. As I add a new component, my residuals will go down. Yeah. So the number of projections you have is actually the number of A scores? The number of components, yeah. So every time I add a new component, I'm, I'm going from a straight line as my model with one component. If I add a second component, that model now is not a straight line anymore, it's now a plane. If I add a third component, I create a three-dimensional space. And so each component adds on uh, and, and better explains this x. Okay. So yeah, I apologize if this is a little bit hard to understand. I'll, I'll get a geometric figure and we'll recap this in class next time. So my residual distance will get smaller and smaller with every component. So So if I look at this residual distance, um, we're saying that residual vector is equal to the original vector minus the prediction. And that's for a single row E. I can create this E matrix now for every single row. Okay, so coming back here, this is just for the i row. I can repeat this for every single row in my, in my um, original data set, and I can build a matrix E which happens to have the same dimension as my original matrix, x, but now I get a residual for every single entry. And the notation gets a little bit messy here now because this is my error matrix after one component. Okay, so the, the last subscript represents my component, the 
the first two subscripts represent my row and column uh, in the error matrix. So E N K is the E N K error after one component. So I'm, after adding one component, I've got this matrix, of another whole matrix, the same size as my original uh, data set, with errors. Okay, and ideally those errors will all be small. If that first component really explains all the data very well, the numbers in E will be pretty small. Okay, that's a fair assumption. So, when we try, let's say I've got that matrix E, how can I summarize it for you? Like, one way to, I, I, it's obviously inconvenient to look at a large N by K matrix. What's one way I can summarize those errors in a single number? Sum of squared errors. Sum of squared errors. And what does the sum of squared errors mean? Uh, well, it just doesn't matter whether the error is on like, the upside or the low side. You just want the absolute, like how far away is the thing. So it kind of gets rid of that bias. Good. So some of the squares gets rid of the bias, as you say, the plus and the negative bias. Um, the other thing, whenever you see a sum of squares in any textbook or any um, paper, immediately you need to think variance. Okay, that's all the sum of squares is, it's calculating the variance. Especially if the mean of the errors is equal to zero. So a quick recap here of some stats. Uh, if I take, let's just look at a vector. And now, so here's a vector of errors, E1, to up to EN. So these are numbers that should be relatively small, and I want to calculate the variance of that vector. The definition of variance for vector E is equal to EI minus the average error squared square, and sum of squares divided by n or n minus 1, some books use either one, it doesn't really change too much for a big data set. And you can take the square root if you want the standard deviation. So I will take the standard deviation of the square root all for now, because we're just going to look at the sum of squares. So whenever you see the sum of squares, immediately think variance, because as it is in this case, the mean of this entire matrix is zero. Okay. So, that term goes away. So the sum of squares of the errors divided through by an arbitrary scalar, it doesn't really matter, will give you the variance of this matrix. Okay, that's one, one reason why we use the sum of squares, because it's directly related to the variance, or at least proportional to it, depending on whether it's n, dividing it by n. Variance is equal to sum of squares. Sum of squares is variance there. The same thing. Yeah. 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 The errors will be mean of zero, but we can't say anything about their range. They should be they should be smaller than the original data matrix. Okay, so what we're going to look at in the next few slides here is. I'm going to look at the sum of squares of the entire matrix, the sum of squares of the columns, and then the sum of squares of the rows. Okay, so like I said here before, uh, sum of squares is variance. And variance is equal to sum of squares, so you should have that. And then another way that people summarize variance is by using R squared. And R squared is nothing more than the ratio of two variances. Okay. So R squared in general is always defined as the variance that is explained by the model and the variance with which we start off. And what is the variance we start off with in a PCA model? One. It's the sum of squares of the X matrix. And we know that the variance of one column is equal to one. So the variance of k columns is equal to k. So yeah, that's a few plus now. The variance you write up for one column is, is one. So the variance, the initial variance here, when I say initial variance, it's the sum of squares of my x matrix that I'm starting off with. And on my numerator, I'm going to put the variance that the model explains. 
Now, obviously, if I use no components, zero components, I'm explaining no variance, so my r squared is zero. Okay, so that makes sense. Does it? Shocking, it's looking very confused. So, numerator variance explained by the model. If I've got no components in my model, I'm not explaining anything. My numerator is zero, r squared is zero. If my model is so good that it explains everything in my x matrix, my numerator then is the same as my denominator, and so r squared is equal to one. So that's, those are, that's why people like r squared. It's pretty intuitive. Zero r squared means you're not explaining anything. r squared equals one means you're explaining everything. But everything of what? Whenever you see r squared, you need to say, what is this explaining? Whatever this initial variance is that was chosen by the person. In PCA, our initial variance is equal to, so initial variance is equal to the sum of squares of the entire x matrix. If you just take the x matrix, sum every element in that entire matrix, n times k entries, calculate the sum of squares, and that's your initial variance. You can divide through by, uh, sometimes people will divide through by n times k to illustrate, to indicate that you've got n times k entries, but it doesn't matter. This, this is just a constant, right? As long as you're working work consistently, most of you can just use that. So that's all that r squared is, is a ratio of two variances, and variances, as we said, is just the sum of squares. Yep, yeah, you're thinking A. Yeah. So Eric says here that um, is it, are we going to use R squared maybe as, a med, as an indicator of when to stop adding components? That is one way people do it, though I'll argue in the next class it's a very poor way of doing it. But it is one way people do do it. So it's, it's, it's not a bad, but there's, there's a caution that you need to have in mind when I'll talk about the next class. Um, Uh, okay, so let me just uh, quantify then for the whole matrix capital X. We said variance, um, or R squared, another way in which you can write R squared then is as one minus the variance of X minus X hat divided by the variance which you start off with. Okay. So um, let me just see how I derived that here. So I said R squared is equal to the variance of my model what the model explains divided by the variance initial. Okay, so that what what does the model explain um, is equal to variance of x minus the variance of x hat divided through by the variance. Oh, sorry. So my, what, it, what does my model explain? It's what I started off with minus with what's left over in the residuals, okay? Divided through by my baseline variance. So that's where this equation comes from. I just made the line up. Okay, because let's just take a look here. I, I, Sometimes I, my mind skips over uh, some concepts here which I think I didn't cover earlier. So x is equal to x hat plus my residuals that we explained earlier. So if I, help, if I ask what does my model explain, this is what my model explains. Okay. Using one, or two, or three components. So what model explains So the other way of writing that is x hat is equal to x minus the residuals. And then if I calculate the variance of what the model explains, I can break it down into those two parts. Variance of x minus the variance of the x. Divide through by the variance of x. And then if I simplify that, I get this equation. Okay. So that's where, where that interpretation comes from. But
But either, whichever one you use, if you like to use this interpretation, uh, or if you like to use this ratio of the residuals over x and subtract it from 1, you'll get the same answer. And as I said earlier, if you've got no components, your R squared is 0. And your R squared will increase with every component. That's by definition. PCA is trying to explain variance, so R squared goes up and up and up as you're adding components. When you add your final component, the maximum number of components, you, you explain everything in your R squared. But you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that in most situations. You usually stop earlier. But if you have two, then you have to one more component Your R squared must always go up. It has to go up. Because by definition, PCA is adding that new component in a direction orthogonal to the first and explaining something new. So it must increase. It can never go down. So let's just take an example here. If I have an X matrix where I take my sum of squares and that's my baseline, 100% variance, I add one component. That one component in this particular example happens to explain 73.7%. Then the residuals must contain, by definition, the remaining 26.3%. If I add a second component, the overall R squared jumps up to 92. The individual contribution of that second component is to add an additional 18.5% variance explained. And then my residuals goes down to 7.8. This, this is a real data set. You can, um, you can look at it for yourself afterwards. Uh, and then if I add a third component, notice here the third component only adds an additional 2% R squared bringing my cumulative R squared up to 94, and then my residuals then drops down by that same amount. So as I add, keep adding components, obviously this error matrix, the numbers in E will get smaller and smaller and get closer and closer to zero. The and X hat's numbers will get closer and closer to the numbers in X, <coughs> is what it's saying. So we've got that duality in X. So when, this is, this is a nice way to, to see when we say in PCA, it explains the most variation. It's also exactly equivalent to saying we're, we're getting the lowest error. Because as my error gets lower and lower, I'm explaining more and more variation. Okay, so I'm just trading off here between the two. So PCA, I can say the two things that are identical. I can either say PCA explains the most variation possible, or I can say PCA is minimizing the error. Both of those are exactly the same, because as I do one, I'm automatically doing the other. I'm just pushing the variance around from one <laughs> matrix to the other. So the question is related to outliers, and outliers that keep coming up in today's class. So that's, that's good because they, they're very real in every data set. Um, the question is regarding outliers. Obviously, as you add in components, and you, if you happen to have outliers, you're filling the outliers and not the real structure in the data. Um, so what we'll always do, and we saw that in, in the paper by Swansea Roll, the reading for today's class was, there was that one observation in his uh, paper. Let's just quickly show you where. Um, so there was this plot in, zoom in. So this was in the, in the journal article. He fit a PCA model, and most of the data seems to be around here, but then you've got this one data point way out here. It's obviously an outlier, and it totally biased the PCA model because it's such a large outlier. We remove it, and then we rebuild the model without it because you're really not fitting the, the variance in the data matrix, you're really just fitting the outlier. 
once you remove it, you'll actually see your 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 uh, your thoughts change, and you get a, a different, more correct interpretation. No, yeah, you remove fewer components because yes, your first component is explaining the outliers, and then the other components are explaining the, the other variation. So I think outliers will become. Um, you, in the first few data sets we look at, I won't put any outliers in, in obvious outliers. But as we start to deal with real data sets, there will be outliers and we need to treat them. And, but you'll get more comfortable with it once you're uh, used to PCA. Um, okay, so I just want to quickly finish up the last few slides and then we'll look, move over to using the software. The other way we can look at, at the residuals is one column at a time. So in my X matrix, I take a particular column, XK. I've got my prediction of X called X hat, and I've got my residuals error for that column, EK. And I can calculate R squared using exactly the same equation just for that column. So same formula, except now instead of using the entire X matrix, I use just that column from X. And this gives me the R squared for that column. I can calculate the R squared for every single column in the data set. And a good way to show that those R squared values, one for each column, is using which visualization tool? <coughs> Brad? Which visualization tool might you use if you wanted to plot the R squared values from every column? So I've got one R squared value for every column. What would you use in, say, Excel to plot it? Okay, so but every column is there's no time relationship between columns. Uh, which which plot would you choose in MATLAB or Excel to plot? Excel. Sorry. Excel. Yeah, but which plot would you choose? So if you're using Excel or if you're using MATLAB, which plot would you select to to look at the data visually? Uh, yeah. uh, that's for data. Let me just recap what we have here so, so it's clear how uh, I'm asking. So I'm calculating an R squared value for every column, so column one, column two. So I'm getting, let's say, 10% for the first column. I'm explaining 9% for the second column. I'm explaining 27% for the third column, etc. And then maybe this last column is explained for the fourth percent. A good way to visualize that data is to is, is to is to oh, bar plot, right? Um, so it's exactly the same thing, right? It's, it's a just different sort of knowledge. So ten percent, nine percent, twenty-seven percent, fifty-four percent of the data up here. So we've got variable one, variable two, variable three, up to variable k. Okay. So bar plots are great for visualizing any quantity that we summarize for the columns. We'll often use bar plots, and the software will automatically draw a bar plot for you. You'll see that coming up next. Okay, and in the paper here by uh, Swanti Wall, there was also he gave a great a great way to illustrate this. Um, if you just find it here, over here. So here he's plotting for a couple with zero components. You're not explaining any variance. As I'm adding a component, okay, so <laughs> this name a little bit back, but he's called this unexplained variance. So the black region is the part that's not explained, the white region above it is the part that is explained. So with zero components, I'm not explaining anything. As I add one component, that little white sliver over there represents the part that is explained. Then I add a second component that drops. And a third component that drops even more. Every time I add a new component, all these numbers will go down. In other words, my errors for every column in my data matrix must decrease as I add components. Okay. And, but they'll decrease at different rates. So this, this variable 2 is not well explained by, by this, this component. It is a slightly better explained once I add a second component. But you can see as I add a third component, it still hasn't gone down by any by much more, whereas these other variables have dropped quite a bit. So looking at the R squared bar plot as you add components is helpful to also understand the model. Uh, 
it depends which way you're looking at. Here I'm looking at the bars of errors. So I want shorter bars. Here I'm looking at variance explained. So I want larger values. I want higher values. So uh, you don't often see this representation. We're more used to seeing larger bars. So the, you want every variable to be well explained. Variables with small bars are not well explained much more. Then I need to put some more add another component or investigate why that variable is not well explained. Maybe that variable is just noisy and there's nothing to explain about it. Maybe uh, it could, could be components and the variable one of them could one go down. down. Yeah, we'll see that. that. That's quite common. We'll talk about that as well uh, in, in future classes when we look at applications. Okay. So I think you're kind of ready to start using the software now. Uh, what Today's class was really just uh, oh wait, there's one more topic before we go to solve it. Uh, today's class is just to introduce the concepts and look at a little bit of mathematics. Next class we'll look at, at a bit more on the actual algorithm itself. Yes. Yeah, just have a quick question. Are we going to do with eigenvalues like as we did today or not? <laughs> okay, eigenvalues and, and singular values are just another way to calculate PCA. If you understand eigenvalues, it will enhance your understanding. And next class, we'll look a little bit at eigenvalues will come up. Um, so if it's a topic you're totally unfamiliar with, it's worth looking at. But we will recap in the next class. One other uh, concept we just need to understand before we look at the software is to look at the row residuals. Okay? So I've looked at the residuals for the entire X matrix. I've looked at it from a column point of view. We can also look at the residuals within a row. And the residuals for the ith row can be written as x minus x hat. So I calculate x minus x hat for the first column, x minus x hat for the second column, etc. And so this will create a vector with k values in it. Okay? One residual for every column in my matrix. And if I calculate the variance of those residuals, it's just the sum of squares of those errors. And if I calculate the sum of squares, obviously what's the minimum value that I can have for sum of squares? The zero. That point will be right on the model plane as we discussed earlier. Okay. That variance is often called the square prediction error because it is exactly that, the sum of squares of the prediction errors. And mathematically you can write it as E transpose E, so it's a dark product of the of the vector itself. And some software packages will use the square root of that distance, uh, the square root of that SPE to create a distance. Okay, so if you take the square root of a sum of squares, you get a, a length, and they'll call that E mod X or distance to the model. So it's not quite, some software packages vary on this, they'll divide through by SPE, sometimes they'll put a scaling factor in there, but in general, it's the square root of the sum of squares. Okay, so I think that's enough uh, talking from my side. I, let's, let's look at the software.